Okay, welcome to the Monday Night Bible Study, and we are continuing with 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And before we begin, let's go ahead, have a short word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much that uh, we could uh, get together like this on the internet and and people can watch this on, on YouTube. And we thank you for everyone that's participating tonight. And Lord, we just, just pray that everything goes smoothly and that we have no glitches. And we pray, Lord, that as we come to your word tonight, that we would be encouraged to study your word. We'd be encouraged in faith. Uh, we be comforted uh, by the word. We'd be rejoicing uh, by the word and that um, our faith is made stronger and that we would be encouraged to study on our own. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. So again, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and last time we were in 1 Corinthians 12, we left off about verse 13. Now, chapter 12 is where Paul starts to talk a lot about uh, the sign gifts that were given to the early church, and he's dealing with the Corinthian church on the issue of their immaturity, their selfishness, their desire to want to be sensational by searching after uh, this gift and that gift. Uh, and uh, there's some indication that there were people that actually were trying to fake the gifts. And so he explains how the gifts work, what they're for, what their function is. And uh, he delineates everything very clearly uh, so that there's no mistaking that. Uh, what the gifts are and what they're for. Um, and primarily, he's dealing with this issue of uh, the Corinthian church not understanding and not appreciating the fact that they are, they're all to work together as one unit. The local assembly, when I'm talking about the local assembly, I'm talking about the physical uh church that's located in Corinth. And of course, the body of Christ is universal. Everybody that is saved is a member of the body of Christ, but Paul is dealing specifically with the local assembly. And he's emphasizing the fact that the local assembly needs to work together as a unit. But that wasn't the attitude of many of the people in the church at Corinth. And so he's dealing with this issue and showing them how important it is that everybody work together and everybody recognize the, the importance of each gift and the importance of each member of the local assembly. So let's start with verse 14, and we're going to read down through verse 18. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, am I not of the body? Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased, him. So again, God is wanting to get the idea across to the Corinthians, the importance of everybody having their own particular gift. Uh, and some people, the, some people in the local semi had no gift. They had no sign gift. They had no miraculous gift. But everybody needed to work together. Uh, as a unit uh, for the purpose of edifying the body of Christ with these gifts. So let's talk for a minute about the fact that God himself chose who in the local assembly would have 
each gift, uh, who would have this gift and who would have that gift and who would not have a gift. And because he says in verse 18, but now God has set the members, every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him. So the people in the assembly did not choose what sign gift they would have. They didn't choose any gift on their own. God decided who would have what gift. Now, today it's different. Today, in, 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 in the time in which we live today, after the, the, the need, the purpose of the sign gifts have passed, uh, things are different now. For example, turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. First Timothy chapter three, look at verse one. Verse one of chapter three says, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So the office of a bishop is something that a man would desire. So he doesn't he isn't given a special gift from God. He's not given a special calling. God doesn't speak to him and tell him, I want you to be a bishop. It simply says, if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. But then he goes on to explain what the qualifications, what the standard is for becoming a bishop. And of course, bishop is the highest position of leadership in the local today we refer to them as pastors but bishop is to be to be precise bishop is the actual title uh, that he should have so if he desires that office then he desires a good work uh, and then he he delineates what the standards are uh, and then if you go to uh first timothy chapter five first timothy chapter five verse one he says uh rebuke not an elder but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren the elder women as mothers the younger as sisters with all purity and so on. So instead of having sign gifts, now that we have the completed canon of the scripture, now that we have the complete revelation from God, we no longer need the sign gifts. And instead we have people in the local assembly who desire the office of a bishop, who are elders in the faith, uh, not necessarily elders in as, ma as a matter of age, but elders in the faith, people have been saved a long time, uh, as, as in a position of leadership in the local assembly. But look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, and a verse that we are very familiar with, but look at verse, uh, yeah, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Apologize. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So instead of being given a spiritual gift to teach, teaching is committed to faithful men. And then you go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, where it says, 
Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So to be a a um, a workman for God, if you're going to do the works that God wants you to do, what do you have to do? You have to study the scriptures. You have to rightly divide the word of truth instead of having a sign gift. Um, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this is the reason why you don't need the sign gifts any longer. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. So it's God breathed. That is word inspiration. You can see in the word inspiration in spirit. Asian. It's the idea of God's spirit, you know, infused in the words on the page. So all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be for perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And all those things that are listed there, uh, doctrine, Reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. Well, those were all the things that were the end result of having the sign gifts. If you had the sign gifts, that's what they were for. They were there to give you doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction in righteousness. That's what the gifts, sign gifts were there for. And But now that you have all scripture, you don't need those sign gifts. And so you have a different dynamic going on in the local assembly. Uh, rather than using sign gifts, we, we, have, we have God's word. And so the spirit works through the word of God today. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 17, Paul says in talking about spiritual warfare, he says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So the sword of the spirit is the word of God. It's both a defensive and offensive weapon. And so the spirit is working through the word of God. Look at Ephesians chapter five, Ephesians chapter five, verse 17. He says, wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. So you can understand what the will of the Lord is by simply studying the scriptures. Verse 18, and be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. So, what does it mean then to be filled with the Spirit today? And he's telling the church at Ephesus to be filled with the Spirit. It's not something that is forced upon the believer. It's something that a, a believer chooses a believer chooses today to be filled with the Spirit. And how do you be filled with the Spirit today? Well, look at verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And then it goes on and talks about the relationship between the husband and wife and the children and the local church. These are the evidences of being filled with the Spirit. But I think the perfect cross-reference to this is found in Colossians chapter 3. If you look at, if you look at Colossians chapter 3, notice that the wording is almost identical to what we just read in Ephesians 5, 
where he says in verse 16 of Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3 verse 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands and so on. So you see, it reads almost identically to what we read in Ephesians chapter 5. And so the only thing that's really different in its content and its, 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 its uh, concepts is Ephesians 5 says, be filled with the Spirit. Colossians 3 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That, that tells me that there's a correlation there. That to be filled with the Holy Spirit is to let the word of God, the word of Christ, dwell in you richly. So I hope you see that correlation there. Uh, because if the words of God, which are God-breathed, Spirit-infused, if the words of God dwell in you richly, then naturally you will be filled with the Spirit. Uh, so let's let's move on then to uh, chapter 1 Corinthians chapter 12 again. And this time we're going to look at verse, verse 19. Moving on to verse 19, he says, verse 19, and if they were all one member, where, uh, where we're, were the body? And so, again, it's the idea, uh, you know, is you can't, a body can't be you know, one body part. The whole body can't be one body part, right? It's ridiculous. It can't function that function that way. It's absurd to think that the body could function with just one kind of member. You know, if your whole body was a nose, that's all I could do is smell, right? And it's, of course, that's very silly to think to think something like that. But that's that's what the church at Corinth was about. They were all about themselves. They weren't thinking of everybody working together as a unit to accomplish what God wants accomplished. They were all thinking about themselves individually. So let's let's um, look at verse twenty then. But now are they many members yet, but yet one body? And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And again, with the church at Corinth, they they wanted they wanted the the more dramatic, sensational kinds of gifts to draw attention to themselves. And so Paul or so the Lord through Paul's writings are calling them out on this. And it says in verse 23, and those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. So in the eyes of God, those parts of the body, so to speak, the members of the church that are kind of looked down upon or are considered to be less important, God bestows upon them more honor than the others. Just the opposite of what they were doing. Then he says, verse 24, for our comely parts have no need, 
But God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which which lacked. Um, in other words, lacked in the sense that they were not as sensational or they were not as, you know, demonstrative or not as got as much attention. Uh, verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body. And of course, schism has to do with having these little uh, cliques within local assembly um, and uh, having people divided in the local assembly over over the doctrines and and over, you know, I, this is actually a true story. Uh, and I don't know if you've ever experienced this. There's There was a church once that actually was split over the color of the carpet. Yes. And so uh, not a lot has changed since, since the church at Corinth, unfortunately. And so um, when you have a, again, when you have a schism, you have one small group within the assembly that are following one teaching or one personality. And then you have another little group within the assembly is following another person or another personality or another doctrine that's, and they're not agreeing with one another. Um, verse 25, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And we saw that issue with the Lord's Supper back in chapter 11, where there was not that care for the other members. And they were treating the Lord's Supper as though it was meant to be some kind of a, a pagan party. Um, but let's go back to verse 26 now in chapter 12. And whether one mem member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all members rejoice with it. That's the way it should be in the local assembly. Because everybody should be, should be uh, focused on the word of God and what it's teaching. Everybody should have that one commonality, that one thing that bonds them together. And that should be their central focus. It w but that was not the case in Corinth. Verse 27. Now we are the body of Christ and members in particular. Um, Paul begins to describe um, what the um, different offices are in verse 28 um, and how they coincide with the gifts that were given. Okay, and I think you'll see what I mean here in a minute. But if you look at verse 28, he says, and God hath set some in the church. And again, these are not self-appointed positions. These are not self-appointed offices. God is the one who chose who would be an apostle, who would be a prophet. It's God doing the choosing. It's God giving the gifts. These people are not, um, in other words, you, you couldn't, you couldn't say, decide one day, well, I think I want to be an apostle or I want to speak in tongues or something like that. You you didn't have that choice. It was God giving, it was God giving the gifts. If you go back up to verse 18, it says, but now God has set the members, every one of them in the body as it hath pleased him. So God makes the decision who would, hold what office and who would have the gifts. Now, verse 28, and God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps governments, diversities of tongues. 
are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? So these are obviously rhetorical questions. They don't require an answer because the answer is obvious. The answer is no. No, not everybody is an apostle. Not everybody's a prophet. Not everybody's a teacher. Not everybody's a worker of miracle. Not everybody has the gift of healing. Not everybody speaks with tongues. Not everybody interprets. Not everybody could, was given a gift. And God decided who would get what gift. So I want to take this opportunity to give you a brief description from the Bible as to what an apostle is. Uh, an apostle is a office that God gives and it, you, it's not, again, it's not self-appointed. Uh, so what is an apostle? Well, it means, it literally means a sent one, somebody that God has sent. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 10. I'm going to attempt to, to the best of my ability to define each of these offices and gifts. Uh, and um, I could be wrong about some of them, but some of them are very obvious as to what they are. And this is definitely one of them. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, and look at verse, well, let's just start at verse 1. Matthew chapter 10, verse 1. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, that's Peter, James, and John, and the others, uh, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out, and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Now the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, and Zebedee, and so on. Now look at verse 5. These 12 Jesus sent forth. That's why they're called apostles, because it means God is sending this person. That's what an apostle is. And he tells them in verse 5, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then he tells them what? Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely ye receive, freely give. So it's, it's very clear. An apostle is somebody that God himself personally sends out with a specific message. And he has the ability to do all these signs and wonders. Turn with me to the Gospel of, of the Gospel of John, chapter thirteen. The Gospel of John, chapter thirteen. And I want you to look at verse 20. John chapter 13, verse 20. Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that receiveth whomsoever I send, and again, that's referring to the apostles because it's, it's someone that God personally sends with a certain message. Whomsoever I send receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. You see that? God sent Christ, and Christ sends Peter, James, and John, and the others. That's why they're called apostles, because they're sent by God himself. Turn with me to the Gospel of John chapter 17. John 17.
and look at what the Lord says in his prayer to the Father. He says in verse, start with verse 6, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest me them, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known all things whatsoever I have given them are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou sent, have given me, that they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I, have glor I am glorified in them. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Again, to be, to be an actual apostle, you have to be personally sent by God himself with a specific message. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul says in verse 12, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So again, he's speaking of himself. Okay. Uh, right. We well, may have to edit that out because we have somebody who cannot hear me. All right. I hope they can hear us now. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, I am not muted. My mic is open, so I don't know what, what's going on. Well, I guess we'll have to edit that out. I apologize if anybody can't hear me. Okay, all right. Uh, I was quoting from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, and uh, point out the fact that Paul, the Apostle Paul, had the signs of an Apostle. And he was called directly by God with a specific message. If you look at Acts 9, before he became the Apostle Paul, he was Saul of Tarsus, and Christ appeared to him personally and spoke to him in Acts chapter 9. And you can read about that in Acts 9 verse 4. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So Paul was called, in a sense, the same way Peter, James, and John was. It was the Lord directly speaking to him, and he gave Paul the ability to do signs and wonders. So that was just a brief description of what an apostle is actually is. Uh, and of course, based upon that definition, upon the biblical definition of an apostle, nobody today qualifies to be an apostle. So again, there are no apostles today because nobody uh, has God speaking to them directly and giving them uh, sending them out to, with a specific message uh, because we have the complete revelation from God in the first place. And uh, 
signs and wonders are not being done today because we have the completed revelation from God. So that's why there are no apostles today. Now let's go back to Second or First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse eighteen, uh, verse twenty-eight. Excuse me. And and God has set some in the church first apostles. So we describe what an apostle is. Apostle was necessary because new revelation was being given. There were revelation that was not written down in God's word. And so God is using apostles to write down this information. Now, secondarily, you have prophets. And what was the job of the prophet? Well, think about this for a minute. There was only one man who initially received direct revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ about the church, the body of Christ, and the dispensation of grace, and everything that, that goes with it. No, I'm sorry, I don't. I don't see Kimmy. Okay, we'll move on and we'll just edit that out. Okay, now, again, secondarily, we have prophets. And normally when you think about a prophet, you think about somebody who is, uh, who is foretelling the future, uh, who's giving new revelation, but that is really not the role of the prophet here. The role of the prophet in the early church to declare things by the Spirit of God that were complementary and confirming and affirming what Paul had already preached. In other words, new revelation came directly to the to the apostle Paul, but that but there was no new revelation going to anyone else. Okay. All the new revelation came to Paul only. And then he communicated that new revelation to others. But the role of the prophet in the early church was simply to confirm, if you will, what Paul had already uh, revealed. Okay, uh, how, why do I say that? Well, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 36. Paul says, what? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So what Paul is doing, he's calling people out who were obviously trying to fake the gifts, trying to fake the gift of prophecy, uh, because it's inferred that some people were claiming to be prophets who were saying things contrary to what Paul taught. But Paul is saying, if you really have the gift of prophecy you're going to acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord so the the gift of prophecy in the early church was to confirm and acknowledge everything that Paul had revealed to them okay um so that's that was the gift of prophecy the second one or the third one was teachers now some people say god has gifted somebody to teach because they do, do such a great job of it and so god has gifted this person to teach so the gift of teaching is still in effect today well i i have to disagree with you on that i don't believe that's what is i think what 
Paul is referring to there when we're talking about the gift of teaching or the or a teach somebody or the office of teacher is somebody who was actually gifted by the Holy Spirit to give the audience a understanding of what is what God had revealed to Paul. If you go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 8. He says, for one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. And so that would seem to coincide with the gift of teaching, because teaching is helping someone understand. Okay, and so that sounds to me like the gift of the word of wisdom. Now, let's look at um, the next one on the list is after that miracles, we're back at verse 28 of chapter 12. After that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governs, diversities of tongues. And again, remember the gift of healing, the gift of miracles, these were sign gifts. They were given to the early church not to simply help the early church, but as a sign to the unbelieving Jew. Um, keep your hand here and look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. For the Jews require a sign. The Jews require a sign because... The Jews are God's sign people. They were formed on the basis of signs and wonders. From the very beginning of the uh, Jewish people, the Jewish nation, the Hebrew people, God dealt with them on the basis of signs and wonders. So they require a sign. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 verse 22 wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe but to them that believe not you see so the signs and wonders the tongues and the, the doing of miracles were to provoke israel unbelieving israel to jealousy uh, if you look at Romans chapter 11, he says, speaking of Israel in verse 11, chapter 11, verse 11, I say then, had they stumbled that they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office, if by any means I may provoke to emulation them that are my flesh, and might save some of them. So, by God going to the Gentiles and saving them, and giving them signs and wonders in the beginning of the church, he is attempting to provoke unbelieving Israel to jealousy. Because this, by giving the Gentiles signs and wonders, they would know from the Old Testament that that meant God was going to the Gentiles and had stopped going to the Jews. Okay, now with that in mind, let's go back. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians and let's look at that list of offices again. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 
there's the miracles, there's the gifts of healings, there's helps. Now that's kind of tricky. I, I'm not sure what he means by helps as a gift. I'm just going to take a, take a shot at it and say that the uh, gift of helps has to do with simply uh, being having a ability to encourage one another and strengthen one, one another's faith. Um, so that that's my best my best shot at that. Governments, I think governments uh, has to do with governing, obviously. And one of the gifts that seems to be one that would be a, a governing kind of gift in the church will be back here in verse uh, 10. If you go back to verse 10, it says, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits. So having the ability to discern spirits would be to me a governing gift because you would need somebody to discern who was really speaking uh, by the Holy Spirit and or and who was who's possibly someone faking it. So it sounds like to me that would be a one of the uh, roles of somebody with the gift of government is to have the discerning of spirits. Then he says diversities of tongues. And of course, that would be someone who would have the ability to speak multiple languages without ever having gone to school to learn them. Um, very much like what you would see, like you would see uh, possibly in Acts chapter 2, where they're actually speaking languages, actual languages, and they actually name the languages and everybody that was from those different countries where those languages were, were spoken understood what they were saying uh so it wasn't just you know the gibberish that you hear today these were actual languages so they had the gift of diversities of tongues and then again the rhetorical question verse 29 are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, all workers, and miracles? Obviously, no. But then he says, verse 31, but covet or desire earnestly the best gifts, and yet, he says, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. And what would that more excellent way be? Well, get in, let's go into chapter 13 for a little bit. We won't go into the whole chapter tonight, but Let's just look at the first three verses of chapter 13. He says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. So even though you have this gift and have not charity, I become as sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. And verse two, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have that charity, I am nothing. Look at verse three. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have that charity, it profiteth me nothing. Why is that? Because charity is the motive behind what you're doing. Um, if you go to, if you go back to, um, Acts or excuse me, first Corinthians, uh, chapter eight, he says in verse one, now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that all have knowledge, knowledge puffeth up, but what? Charity edifieth. Because what is the point of having the knowledge if you don't have charity? 
because the knowledge is supposed to edify the believer. But if you don't balance the knowledge with charity, it doesn't, it doesn't edify. It doesn't accomplish what you intended to. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say I am trying to impart some knowledge to you, but I am being mean-spirited about it. I'm being judgmental to you. I am calling you names. I'm labeling you. I'm putting you down. I'm saying you're stupid for not knowing that. That would be trying to communicate knowledge without charity. Charity is supposed to be coupled with knowledge so that the person is edified, the person is built up in the faith. But you can present knowledge in a such a way that it doesn't build them up in the faith, but just tears them down. You may have heard the old expression, people don't know how much you don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Well, you know, a lot of times that does come across. You don't always sense it, but a lot of times that does come across if someone doesn't care. They're simply trying to, you know, beat you over the head with something. And so charity needs to be there. Charity is your motive. Charity has the attitude, I really truly care about your spiritual well-being. So I'm going to talk with to you with respect and patience and kindness. I want you, I want, there's something I want you to know, but I'm going to present it to you again with respect, gentleness, and patience. And that's the difference. So Paul says, I don't care how much you know, I don't care what kind of gift you think you have, whatever. If you don't have the charity, you're just the sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. So that's why charity is the more excellent way. And I think that's what Paul is trying to get through, get across to the Corinthians. So uh, next Monday night, we'll pick up in chapter 13. Thank you.